Good morning, everybody. Good morning, colleagues, whatever, whatever you are. And thanks for, for joining us. My name is Juan Carlos Sanchez. I work with GAZ, with the Transboundary Water Corporation in the Nile Basin Project, specifically working on the topic of wetlands and uh, biodiversity. Uh, welcome very much. Welcome to uh, this event on Climate Smart Transboundary River Basin Development. It is a pleasure to be your host and also a pleasure to be with, uh, with all of you. Um, the idea behind this, behind this event comes from a long-standing uh, 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 work that we have been doing with, with several colleagues, some of the institutions represented also here in this, in this webinar, uh, where we started discussing what are, the, what are the links between water and climate change uh, uh, for a long time. There was this recognition that, of course, the topic was relevant in terms of adaptation, but we have come a long way since then, recognizing that the water and climate are definitely a, a, an intrinsically linked. And uh, that's already very important gains that we have made not only within the water community, but also within the, within the climate change community and even taking the, the topic forward in a, a, into the UNFCCC negotiations and whatnot. So I think that's very positive and we have to recognize where we come from, but also we have to understand that there's still uh, many challenges, especially in the, in the, in the in the topic of transboundary water management, where we haven't been able to really permeate all of these climate change considerations into work plans of uh, river basin organizations mainly, and then trickle down this one into annual budgets, into 10-year plans, into strategies, and uh, uh, also into investment plans looking into the future. So even though we have that technical recognition that yes, of course, climate change is going to be critical as we understand transboundary water management for the future. We still have to make sure that this, uh, this, 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 this understanding permeates into a uh, policy and management documents, especially from transboundary river basin organizations. So that means in a way that we are halfway through the journey. We have made a, a, and achieved several milestones. However, we have to continue working more with our political partners, with our with our uh, different stakeholders to make sure that we get where we need to get. So uh, with those very brief remarks, I would like once again to, to welcome you and welcome all the, all the speakers. Just to let you know, we have had a couple of very brief uh, changes on the on the on the program. And uh, we will have the pleasure of hearing from Ms. Hannah Ploitnikova, uh, the welcoming and, and, and setting up that uh, uh, overarching political scene. Then we will hear from, uh, from our colleague uh, Lilian Niaega, Wetlands International, a specific case study of the work that we have been doing precisely in institutionalizing aspects of climate change adaptation and mitigation into transboundary uh, wetlands and water management instruments. And finally, we will hear from our colleagues from IUCN on, on practical solutions on how to go about this uh, linking water and climate change uh, into different uh, instruments at the at the global level, trickling down into specific river basins. So, without you, uh, I would like to give the floor now to Ms. Anna Plotnikova, who is going to give us uh, the welcoming uh, re remarks and uh, and the keynote speech. Thank you, Ms. Hannah. Hello, dear colleagues. I hope you can hear and see me well. I'm uh, very grateful for invitation for this event. And as mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Hanna Plotnikova. I'm coming from the uh, Secretariat uh, of the Water Convention. Uh, it is hosted by the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. And uh, uh, mainly I am responsible for the area of cl and climate change adaptation in transboundary basins. 
And just to say a few words about the Water Convention, it provides a unique uh, global legal and intergovernmental framework for cooperation and climate change adaptation. And it is really now a global instrument because we have uh, 44 parties, including parties from Africa and uh, many more countries who are interested in acceding to the convention. Uh, with regards to climate change, uh, we have uh, the body, which is called the Task Force on Water and Climate since 2006. And it is responsible for planning the activities on climate change adaptation under the convention. And also we have a more technical instrument, which is a global network of basins working on climate change adaptation. And these are actually 18 basins from different regions across the world, which meet uh, annually and biannually sharing experience in climate change adaptation, like developing and implementing the climate change adaptation frameworks. And uh, speaking um, about uh, um, the uh, need of uh, transboundary cooperation in climate change adaptation, I would say that uh, climate change uh, doesn't recognize borders and uh, transboundary rivers and lakes also do not recognize borders. Therefore, these things are interconnected. And in fact, uh, transboundary cooperation helps to address efficiently climate change impacts such as floods and droughts. Also, if countries cooperate, it means they share data, they share knowledge. So they, this also helps to reduce uncertainties mm -hmm. and to identify uh, better uh, adaptation priorities. And also transboundary cooperation even helps to coordinate activities in national adaptation planning. For example, even in uh, development and implementing uh, such uh, policy documents as national adaptation plans and national determined contributions. And at the end, all this helps to share costs and benefits by countries and to use uh, human and financial resources more efficiently. Uh, and here I would like to refer to the recent results uh, of the uh, reporting on uh, SDG indicator 652. It is actually about measure measuring the progress in transboundary water cooperation in countries. And the second um, reporting exercise was done in 2020. Uh, and it shows uh, the results which can be useful for this particular um, event, uh, because actually this indicator looks uh, at uh, what kind of transboundary agreements or arrangements uh, exist between countries uh, on uh, waters and uh, what uh, um, the activities of the joint bodies, for example, river basin organizations uh, include. So here you can actually see uh, the list of topics uh, which are included in transboundary agreements or other arrangements. And unfortunately, we see uh, that if we speak about climate change adaptation, it's less uh, uh, than half of uh, um, transboundary agreements um, in included. And uh, if we look at floods and droughts, uh, with floods, the situation is a bit uh, better, but still there is some room for improvement. And uh, to, to be honest, if we have another uh, question according to this report and uh, mainly uh, what are the activities of the joint bodies. We have a similar situation that although climate change is a big challenge, uh, only uh, fewer than half of joint bodies uh, have it as an area of cooperation. And of course the situation is uh, better with the flood and uh, drought management. It's uh, about uh, 70%, uh, meaning that actually a lot of countries um, within transboundary um, uh, organizations cooperate on floods and droughts as part of uh, climate change, but still there is room for improvement. And speaking about financing also, uh, if, uh, if we, are take a question, uh, what is the main uh, challenge uh, for the transboundary bodies? It, it's still uh, the lack of uh, resources, including financial resources. It's about half of, uh, of uh, the 
or about uh, 50%. So this is um, uh, an interesting uh, data, I would, I would say. And uh, although there, um, uh, there are challenges for finance and transboundary cooperation overall, of course, uh, if we speak about transboundary climate change adaptation, it is even more challenging because uh, there are much uh, fewer uh, resources for transboundary action than for the national one, but they still exist. For example, if we take the climate funds, we can say uh, that the adaptation fund uh, does uh, finance transboundary cooperation and even 20% of its portfolio is spent for so-called regional window. And there are some examples uh, of such projects like in the Walter Basin, Lake Victoria, Dream and others. The climate, the Green Climate Fund uh, also supporting some activities like in the Niger Basin, but still a more focus is on the national action. And of course, uh, JF International Waters uh, are supporting a lot of transboundary cooperation where climate change is included as part of it. Uh, so we should actually remember that transboundary and regional organization can bring additional funding even to countries, but for that they also need capacity uh, building in developing bankable project proposals, which remain still a challenge. And here there is one of the resources which was developed by the World Bank in cooperation with UNEC and other partners exactly on this uh, topic, building capacity for uh, transboundary climate change adaptation financing. So there is a link for this. Also, um, just to sum up, I would say that these topics would be discussed at our next uh, meeting of the parties, with the, which is at the um, very uh, end of September, 1st October, and you are welcome to join. And if you are interested in more guidelines, they are available on my presentation and it will be uploaded on the platform. Thank you a lot for your um, uh, attention. Yes, thank you so much, Hannah. Always a very, very um, informative and also very critical for uh, for moving forward. And, and the, of course, the work that the, that the convention has been doing for for now many many years has been a, a critical in bringing a, together these these issues of a, of water and climate change together. Now I would a, I would I would challenge as we as we as we move forward. I would put the challenge out there and uh, and even take it to the next level. I would argue that instead of 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 uh, thinking of them as two different uh, areas of work that have to come together, I would argue that the climate has to be fully embedded into water management and water uh, uh, resources development uh, um, as part of as part of a, a one of the of the aspects to be to be taken into consideration um, and that's a little bit of the of the work that we have been also trying to do with uh, with our colleagues from wetlands international now let me use the, the opportunity quickly to excuse our colleagues from the Nile Basin Initiative. They will not be able to, to make it uh, to the meeting, but uh, part of the work that we have been doing with the Nile Basin Initiative, particularly with uh, the Nile Equatorial Lakes Subsidiary Action Program, NELSAP, uh, is what uh, my colleague from Wetlands International, Lilia Niega, is going to be presenting. So uh, at least we profit also from understanding what has been happening on the ground. Um, I really believe that this story is quite powerful. The work that has been spearheaded by Wetlands International is, 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 is a, it's very interesting. So I also hope that you enjoy it as, as much as we, as we have. Lilian, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, and I'll um, proceed to share my screen. Uh, once again, thank you, and Carlos. Um, it is always a pleasure to talk about transboundary wetland management planning, um, and also a real honor to have this conversation with you all. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to shed some light on the extraordinary peatland ecosystems of the Nile Basin, 
and how we have been able to integrate um, these climate um, superstars um, in transboundary wetland management plan. So I think we begin from uh, the understanding and increasing recognition um, of wetlands uh, as fundamental for our collective well-being in terms of them being essential ecosystem services, um, not just as a reservoir for high species diversity, but also looking at them as sources for food and water security, uh, provision of natural buffers to prevent flooding, so such looking at them as nature's shock observers. And of course, we're still filtering and being able to purify water. They serve as um, sustainable carbon sinks, as well as in general, providing opportunities for sustainable economic growth. But despite uh, looking at these wetlands um, and this value, uh, the negative trajectory for these fragile ecosystems has um, kept its own pace. And I think uh, more so for transboundary wetlands. And to contribute efforts to addressing these challenges, uh, Wetlands International, together with Nile Basin Initiative and GIZ, we have been involved in a program on support to transboundary water operation in the Nile River Basin. And this program has, um, we have been implementing it for the past two years, and it has been aimed at uh, advancing conservation of Nile Basin transboundary wetlands of regional significance. And the focus has been this, three transboundary wetlands. The first one is Sango Bengen Zero, which is shared between Tanzania um, and Uganda. And we also have some Liki Delta wetland, which is an iconic wetland that is shared between the Democratic Republic of Congo and Uganda. And lastly, the Sesicheko wetland that is shared between um, Kenya and Uganda. So to support um, the implementation of conservation and management measures for these transboundary wetlands, uh, we undertook a participatory process um, that included find, defining the scope. So uh, what, where, where are the boundaries for these wetlands? Um, what um, uh, are the challenges of these wetlands face? So identifying the conditions and trends. And we did this by developing wetland monographs. So these wetland monographs are basically um, a baseline uh, reports or surveys for these wetlands, so the basic baseline conditions um, for the wetlands. And we then went on to prioritize um, the issues found within the wetlands. So the priority included uh, ecological issues, social issues, and economic impacts. So in order to develop these wetland management plans uh, for environmental conservation. Now, um, uh, as you've heard from Hannah, without these institutional frameworks in transboundary wetlands, then it means that there is no basis for implementing these transboundary wetland management plans. So the institutional frameworks to support implementation of the management plans were also identified, and where there are none, they are proposed for development and strengthening. And then we moved on to supporting decision making, and we are now at the stage of implementation. Uh, so these transboundary wetland management plans for the three sites were um, approved um, uh, by the, these four governments in June of 2020, where these governments raised commitment um, and voiced the, um, their commitment to implement um, the measures that were identified within these wetland management plans. And of course, copies of these uh, transboundary wetland management plans can be found in uh, the Nile Basin Initiative our website. So uh, in terms of the scope of the plans, what do the plans cover? Uh, in general, the plans are anchored on three main areas of coverage. One is ecosystem protection and restoration. So basically looking at uh, how do we conserve wetland, implement wise use measures in line with the Ramsar uh, principles, um, then looking at livelihood improvement. Uh, so uh, detailing uh, sustainable options that will be able to reduce pressure, not just on over lands, but also on exploitation of these wetland resources. And lastly, uh, in issues of governance mechanisms. So looking at how do we support, how do we develop uh, where they do not exist, an enabling environment, uh, not just for dialogue, but for institutional strengthening uh, and for also financial mobilization strategies. Uh, now, in terms of climate change uh, and looking at the discussion for 
for today, uh, pit plans and how we've been able to incorporate climate change into the transboundary work and management plans. Pit plans are of importance uh, within the Nile Basin. And the study that was done by the Nile Basin Initiative uh, in 2019, the carbon study on the Nile Equatorial Lakes region, found that 50% um, of all the peatlands in this region contain more than 70% of total carbon stock. And um, uh, half of them are found within the Kagera Basin, which is part of one of the wetlands in which we're focusing on the Sango Bay Minzira wetland, which you can see uh, on the extreme um, on your left, I believe, uh, where two studies looked at this, um, the value of these carbon stocks. But of course, these wetlands uh, in our um, analysis, we found out that they're continuously being drained. And when they're being drained, uh, they continue to release carbon. So draining peatlands have been found to be large emitters. They are uh, carbon dioxide hotspots under all land exchanges. And these hotspots need to be addressed if we are to achieve our climate change objectives. Now let's talk about the solution. So water is the blood of the peatlands. Um, and it's key to the peatland problems. So peatlands generally need to be wet and uh, rewetted, so in order for them to be effective. And rewetting has been defined by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as a deliberate action of raising the water table on drained soils in order to reestablish water situated conditions. And um, uh, looking at rewetting some of the proposed measures by the stakeholders or one, to promote sustainable land use practices for improved livelihoods and reduced degradation. And paludiculture is actually one of the measures. And for rewetting to be effective, it needs to require serious monitoring. <laughs> Some of the measures that we also propose within the management plans is to conduct monitoring of these land use practices in collaboration with governments and the wetland adjacent communities. So two actions, three folds. The three falls was climate change, biodiversity loss, poor water quality, and quantity. So the two actions that we identified have talked about rewetting and of course restoring the wetland ecosystem. So rehabilitating the forest, the grassland cover, to be able to ensure that carbon um, uh, to, to can be sequestered as it should by the rule of the peatlands. So as I close, uh, some of the three key areas of action that we identified was one, um, for, for this uh, peatland conservation to, uh, to be effective, to enable to ensure that they're productive is that it is urgent for countries to raise wetland conservation ambition uh, in order to get closer to national, regional and global goals. Secondly, we need to scale up action and investment in wetland conservation and management um, to address rising needs and bring impact to values they provide. You've seen the role of uh, peatlands for uh, and livelihoods. And lastly, uh, the local actors are key to delivering on wetland conservation and management. So any action that is being proposed uh, within the management plan, the local actors uh, have been identified as center, um, uh, as playing a central role um, in ensuring its, its, its success and sustainability. And therefore, strengthening the capacity is one of the key things that the management plans have uh, identified and proposed. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Lillian. Thank you very much for for this 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 very interesting interesting input. I think one of the of the very innovative issues that we that we that we have done together with Wetlands International is this issue of of peatlands. <clears throat> Many of those ones within the Equatorial Lakes region in the Nile Basin, they are actually transboundary in nature, and the, as all of you very well know, they are they are a, a very important a containing CO two stocks. So of course, as a threats continue to, to to threaten wetlands, and the wetlands continue to be converted into agricultural land, for example, then those CO2 emissions, they are released into the, into the atmosphere, contributing negatively to, a, to, to climate change due to greenhouse gas emissions. 
Now, um, one of the important things that I think we wanted to, to highlight with this, with this presentation was um, this issue from moving from, from pilots to uh, making sure that, that these ideas and these concepts get formalized into, uh, into, into proper policy and management instruments. And that's one of the, of the, of the very interesting things that, uh, that the Nile Basin Initiative with support of, uh, uh, of Wetlands International have achieved, which is the fact that, uh, for example, this very innovative issue of, of, of peatlands now doesn't doesn't stay there as, as a pilot, but has been formalized, and now it's part of the of the management plans for three transboundary sites within the within the Nile Basin. So, congratulations to our colleagues of Wetlands International in those good achievements, and hopefully that can also guide the path to other to other uh, uh, river basin organizations where uh, issues of climate change have to still be uh, introduced or, or uh, formalized more, more actively into management plans, into uh, investment programs, etc. So with this idea of, of, of moving from, from, from pilots to, to more formal agreements, to more institutionalized uh, means of cooperation, uh, we would like to give the floor to Diego Jara. Diego Jara is a legal officer within the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the Environmental Law Center. And he has also been working instrumentally with and within several uh, transboundary basins globally, uh, spearheading also these efforts of uh, water and climate change, and, and, and particularly from the governance perspective. So I'm sure he's gonna he's gonna give us some some inputs and some highlights on potential solutions and paths for this uh, scaling up to make sure that the, that the, these issues are also included in policy instruments. Diego, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Juan Carlos, uh, and many thanks to GIZ also for the opportunity to share some of the experiences from IUCN in promoting the governance of transboundary waters around the world. Um, I'm not sure, Juan Carlos, if you can confirm that you can see my presentation. Yes, uh, confirm there. Can you see the uh, presenter's mode or the presentation itself? Just to the check. presentation itself. Perfect. Then thank you very much. As Juan Carlos was saying, my name is Diego Jara. I'm a legal officer at the IUCN Environmental Law Center. And today I would like to bring you from uh, the Horn of Africa to South America. And I would like to share some of the experiences that through a decade of work, IUCN has promoted in uh, the Lake Titicaca and South America. Just uh, a little bit about the Lake Titicaca for, uh, for those colleagues. Who, who perhaps don't, don't, don't know this, uh, this lake. This is a shared uh, basin, a lake basin between Peru and Bolivia. It is the highest lake in the world, the highest navigable uh, lake in the world. And it's of course, as many other uh, hotspots, biodiversity hotspots in, in this region, uh, a, 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 a great place where to find specific endemic fish, birds, and other, other species endemic to the, to the Andes. And of course, the lake itself plays an essential role in shaping the, the climate in, in this region. Just to mention that uh, the Lake Titicaca is part of a whole system or a whole water system as the, the Lake Titicaca feeds one river called the Desaguadero River and also the Lake Popo. And the Lake Popo is uh, an interesting uh, issue from a climate change perspective, as you will see in, in the next slides, as this uh, lake disappeared some, some years ago, precisely because of climate change and mismanagement in, in, in this region. It is important to, to say that uh, the Lake Titicaca provides fresh water for domestic agriculture and industrial uses for more than 1 million people depending on, on this lake, and that also the population living uh, around, around this lake, mainly indigenous communities, rural people, 
they depend mainly on agriculture. The challenges uh, that the lake uh, Titicaca has, as many other lakes and, and rivers in, in the world, uh, specifically through because of climate change, uh, pollution, and mismanagement. But I have chosen two specific challenges that are uh, pillars or that are uh, the, the, the most crucial challenges for this lake, which are the droughts and pollution. Uh, at the moment, uh, the, the scarcity of, of, of rainfall in the region has produced or has, uh, has resulted in the unavailability to <laughs> navigation and to provide uh, normal fishing activities in the region and also to affect agriculture. And also at the same time, in terms of, of pollution, the lack of uh, water the treatment plants and the increase in agriculture activities, the lack of management, uh, waste management um, policies have produced a real catastrophe in, in this lake. Just to, just to mention a little bit in, in detail about the troughs and the water pollution in, in the Lake Titicaca, the troughs are mainly caused by a retreatment or, of glacier and also, and also the short of, of rains in, in, in this region produced by, by climate change and also the increased solar radiation. Let's remember that we are talking about the lake, which is at an altitude of 3,800 meters above sea level. So these are specific conditions that have affected uh, the lake, the, this region, and are causing these intense troughs uh, at the moment. Also in terms of, of water pollution, and as, and as, as I was saying, uh, untreated sewage uh, waters from uh, rural and, and urban areas specifically that just go completely untreated into the lake, the runoff from livestock and farms, and also something critical that needs to be discussed uh, both in Bolivia and in Peru is mining operations, especially illegal mining in, in these areas. All of these uh, uh, wastewater from, from these mining activities end directly in the lake and with that killing all the biodiversity uh, existing in the lake and also affecting the surrounding communities that depend on this, uh, on this lake for drinking water and also for fishing, for agriculture activities. One, one thing that we have to, uh, to see in, the, in this system of the Lake Titicaca, uh, the Lake Titicaca region is that uh, it, the, the Lake Titicaca feeds a, a river, the river the Saguadero, which ends in this, the Lake Popo. The Lake Popo is a lake which is a part of the system of, of, of the Lake Titicaca, but is in, in Bolivia. And already in December 2015, the water levels of the Lake Popo reduced to a level that it actually disappeared. This is, of course, considered to be one of the largest environmental catastrophes uh, in Bolivia, as in a period of nearly uh, less, than, less than 40 years, the lake completely disappeared. And of course, uh, there is uncertainty about the specific reasons that caused the that caused this catastrophe, but of course, two, two main reasons can already be identified being climate change and the diversion of waters for agriculture and mining activities in the region. Nowadays, uh, the Lake Popo is not there anymore, and there are some efforts in order to uh, allocate, allocate water in, in, in what the, the river de Saguadero is, to, uh, to bring to, to life again to the Lake Popo. But this is, of course, not an easy task as it depends on the decisions of both states, in this case, Peru and Bolivia, to provide a climate change plan in order to rescue this, this Lake Popo. Uh, from from uh, the experiences of IUCN in, the, in, the, in this region, 
We specifically work with local communities and mainly with indigenous communities who say that they demand or they would like to be part of the decision making for, for the lake and they want to provide specific solutions because at the end of the day, the indigenous communities, the rural communities who depend on the, on, on the waters and on the, on the resources of the lake are the ones who are affected the, at the first moment, first hand, if there is mismanagement in this, uh, in this basin. And we have here one testimony of one person with whom we have worked and an indigenous leader who said, we demand the right to access information and the right to have full and effective participation in the projects that are carried out through the Titicaca Basin. And this is important because in South America or in the Andean, in the Andean region, uh, where you have a, a large population of indigenous communities, these people who live most, most of the time in mountains, near lakes, near rivers, they are not consulted adequately in the decisions, in the plans that are being made in the resources that they depend on. So from, from IUCN, we have established platforms of dialogue, also promoted the strengthening of capacities to these rural and indigenous uh, peoples. So they can also take part in negotiations, in the decision-making about their sacred lake. And uh, just, to, just, just to mention specific activities, uh, IUCN through the program Bridge for more than, than a decade has promoted dialogue between local stakeholders from both countries, Peru and Bolivia on different issues from transboundary water governance, international law, public participation, environmental governance, in order to understand and to be aware of the potential solutions that they, from the local level, can provide to protect their, their sacred lake. And mainly, of course, uh, through, from this strengthening of, of capacities to the local indigenous leaders, that they can uh, scale, scale up to uh, other communities surrounding the lake. And then in this form, more, uh, more, more people, more communities, are aware of the potential solutions that they can find for climate change and also for environmental, um, environmental uh, degradation, biodiversity protection in the area. We uh, in, in IUCN and with the program which we think or we, we consider that informed dialogue is the main pillar for water and climate diplomacy. And you will see also from the links that I will provide at the end of this presentation, how these people being mostly rural people, indigenous, indigenous communities, they are now being taken part in uh, discussions on the management of the Titicaca Lake, also in negotiations between Peru and Bolivia and mostly that they feel, they feel empowered to, to provide their, their views, their opinions. And as you will see here, even their ancestral knowledge or to provide their uh, sacred, the sacred value that they have for, for this lake, not just in terms of, um, of this being a, a shared resource, but also from the vision that this lake means something beyond, beyond this for this population. And uh, IUCN has promoted specifically a group, a network of, uh, of indigenous women, uh, Mujeres Unidas, uh, or United Women in the Defense of Lake Titicaca, with whom we have strengthened capacities to monitor. And you will see here how ancestral knowledge and new technology is merging in order to protect this sacred lake. So some of the specific activities, as you see also in this picture, is that these indigenous women, they are now measuring the quality of waters. Also, in some cases, they have drones and they take pictures of the lake in order to see how the, how the lake is changing, if it's moving, if there are certain areas which are being dried up at the moment. And mostly that with this information, that these uh, indigenous leaders provide, that they gather information that is 
exchange between the local, the local communities, the indigenous communities, that they provide their opinions, their comments, their solution, and that this is elevated to the national governments, to Peru and Bolivia. This is still something to, to be strengthened, something to be done, um, specifically just before COVID, uh, we were doing these uh, capacity building exercises. We were uh, in, in these processes of training and uh, due to COVID, of course, this couldn't continue as you have to mobilize uh, um, big groups of people. But hopefully when COVID uh, comes, comes to an end, all of these initiatives of collecting the data from uh, what has been done uh, with the local communities can be taken by the governments, by their specific secretaries on meteorology, on hydrology, and that they can take informed decision based on the knowledge from the local stakeholders. Uh, and of course, some of the options that locals have been providing over, over the years to the climate change and environmental challenges that they face is that there are four mainly. The improving of agrobiodiversity and better farming techniques, larger and more inclusive exchange of data and information for decision making, development of green infrastructure, and the creation of platforms for water and climate dialogue. These are specific, these are some of the options or solutions that have been provided by the locals, by the indigenous communities, and they show as well how these uh, ideas or how these uh, mechanisms are not new. As you can see in this, in this picture, already uh, hundreds of, of years ago, there were uh, specific mechanisms for, for instance, of terrace farms or protection. One protection. minute, please. Ah, yes, sorry. One minute. Protection mechanism for the, for the lake. And with this, yes, I, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to, to present. Uh, under the link that I will share with you, you will have you will find more information on the Lake Titicaca and on IUCN initiatives. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Neil. <clears throat> Always very interesting to hear from, from you and the good work that IUCN is doing, not only in, in South America, but also in many other corners of the world. So thank you for sharing. Um, I would like to then follow up with you after after we take some of the questions from the from the chat on issues of data exchange and also on uh, nature-based solutions and green grey infrastructure issues, which, uh, as we all know, IUCN has been one of the promoters of this concept. So uh, it would be interesting to hear more from you on that end. Um, thank you colleagues also for being active on the chat. We have some very interesting questions coming from different colleagues. Um, rather than focusing on, on, on clarification questions to the presenters, I think that they were very, very uh, clear on their, on their presentation. So I think it would be more interesting to hear some of the, of the questions coming from the ground. First one uh, that I would like to take comes from Mr. Mohamed Shahid. Uh, he's asking uh, how climate change will impact the transboundary groundwater resources, especially in Southeast Asia. And he's asking also if this is a hotspot for climate change. I've asked a, a Dr. Sonia Köppel from the UNEC, uh, the, the executive secretary of the uh, UNEC, if she could give us um, uh, her views on this specific issue of groundwater and climate change, and uh, if if she can also, although that's not the focus of the convention, but if she can say something about this this area of Asia. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you very much, and good morning, colleagues. Um, uh, indeed, I'm currently temporarily the secretary of the Water Convention. Thank you for the question. Uh, I am not a groundwater specialist. <laughs> Uh, so I can only give some indications. Um, um, and in general, I think there is still a lot of um, uncertainty about the exact um, impact of climate change on groundwater. Even the latest IPCC report, which has just been published um, a few weeks ago, um, recognizes that there is still a 
a lot of research needed to um, really um, identify the exact climate change impacts on, on groundwater. Uh, they vary across the world. In some re regions, um, uh, groundwater is being further depleted, um, um, also due to increasing abstraction levels. In other regions, uh, uh, groundwater levels can be increasing due to increasing precipitation. And um, in coastal areas, often there is increased saline intrusion into, into groundwater. Um, in, um, um, in the Southeast Asia region, uh, I, um, as I say, I don't have uh, exact um, um, details, but at least in the upper parts of the region, um, according to um, what I what I understand is that there may be increased precipitation, um, but also water depletion and precipitation decreases, uh, uh, and um, and therefore groundwater will be under increasing pressure. Um, as you said, it's a climate change hotspot, and so um, um, there should be measures taken to address this issue. Um, I would like, also like to say one issue, as it has been mentioned by, by my colleague um, Hanna Plotnikova, we are just releasing actually today UNESCO and UNICE the, um, the second report on the SDG indicator 6.5.2, which measures the transboundary water cooperation, and we can see that uh, Asia. <laughs> Um, unfortunately has rather low levels of transboundary cooperation with the exception of the, the Mekong region. And, um, and this um, makes, uh, uh, and particularly also on groundwater, uh, transboundary cooperation is even lower. And um, this uh, highlights the need for further research and further action on the topic of uh, groundwater um, um, transboundary cooperation and climate change adaptation to address this vulnerable resource. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, I think that's that's clear. Also, for for us here in the in the Nile Basin and working with the Nile Basin Initiative, the focus on on groundwater uh, is 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 becoming more and more uh, important as we understand that uh, that issues of groundwater especially in that link with, uh, with, with climate change has not been um, a research and, and it's not uh, so well known. We, we, we have a, a fair understanding of the uh, impact of, of climate change uh, on, on surface, surface water resources, but the groundwater still remains. Uh, one of those big areas or big challenges, and uh, it's it's something that the that the Nile Basin Initiative is putting now a lot of attention to as we move forward uh, to, to develop this new generation of policy instruments that are going to guide the the work of the NBI for the for the for the near future. So yeah, one one of the areas in which we need to continue working. Now, uh, moving forward in, 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 in the questions of the chat, I, I also saw a very interesting discussion uh, triggered by Mr. Simon Tuo and also by our colleagues Stephanie and Jenny uh, on the role of on the role of, uh, of communities, particularly. Mr. Simon is asking what is the experience with local action to incentivize conservation to prevent adverse exploitation and tragedy of the commons. Can it work or most local authorities take strong regulation measures if community action cannot be relied on? And I think that's, a, that's a actually a very interesting a question because it also a, a faces one of the, of the challenges that we, that we see when we're implementing a programs and, and, and plans that the manage at the transboundary level. Um, the issue of, of, of empowerment of local communities, of course, but also of So I would like to give the floor to 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 Julian from Wetlands International, has, that she has been done a lot of work on the ground and uh, and get her views on on this issue of local communities. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, and Carlos, and thank you, Simon, for that question. Um, for transboundary wetlands, where of course governance frameworks on natural resources and management are often conflicting and a source of tension um, in the three wetland sites where we were working, uh, we saw that um, uh, bringing in a blended approach uh, would, was useful in trying to address these challenges. 
So this blended approach was the use of community bylaws, uh, where they are used to regulate the governance, use and management of natural resources. They bring in social issues and cultural issues as well. And they also protect the rights of those that are vulnerable. And uh, because they are developed in a participatory manner by the, by the communities themselves, it means that they, there's a lot of ownership uh, with these bylaws. Uh, implementation um, penalties are also recognized by the communities who develop these bylaws and therefore are, see, are, are thought to be quite useful. And these are some of the bylaws that we have developed or proposed to develop within the transboundary wetland management plans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lilian. I think that's I think that's one of the of the key issues that we have seen uh, in the three different landscapes, transboundary landscapes, where we have been been working on. Um, there is a point here from Mr. Anthony Slater, um, which I I wanted to 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 bring the attention to. He's saying that if the coordinated management of transboundary wetlands adds to the greenhouse gas emission reduction outcomes from a project, couldn't this cooperation benefit be quantified and justified additional funding for joint management costs? And if I understand correctly, um, that's one of the points uh, that was raised by, by our colleague Hannah when she was uh, uh, bringing the attention to uh, the figures that uh, uh, um, funding coming from the, uh, from from adaptation funds and from other climate change funds they 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 are available but we need to make this 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 co benefits clearer uh, also to make potential projects more more attractive this links also to the point by Mr Shakil Hayat on economic valuation of ecosystem services and we need to make sure that as we that as we understand that we make the baselines of the value of several of the of the ecosystem services provided by a, by by rivers and lakes and wetlands and water resources a, on transboundary or national level that we also make sure that these hydrological functions, these climate functions from, a, from, from those water bodies and those water resources, um, they are taken into account explicitly so that they also move forward with, with the implementation of activities, projects, et cetera, that, they, that we understand that these features are also uh, being taken care of. Um, in in that sense, I would like just to to give the floor a last time to Ms. Hanna Plotnikova and uh, try to 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 get from her a couple of insights on uh, from her perspective. Now understanding the financing aspects, what what are two or three key um, uh, uh, tips, key follow ups that uh, she could give us? thinking of uh, accessing climate funds that we, that we could or political partners can also improve when accessing a, a climate funds. Hannah, are you still with us? Yes, sure. Uh, thank you a lot uh, for these important uh, questions and um, giving me the floor. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, indeed uh, while uh, developing project uh, proposals for um, a transboundary cooperation, it is very important to think about uh, climate uh, rational. And I think this uh, question about uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions is related because it is very important to, to uh, showcase and to justify to the donors how a particular project actually is contributing to addressing uh, climate change and uh, is not only focused on other areas like biodiversity conservation or the system conservation or etc and for that uh, uh, like the transboundary river organizations but also uh, countries need to, do need capacity building in preparing bankable project proposals mm -hmm. and uh, with regards to other important uh, things i would say 
that in general, it is important for the organizations which are developing project proposals to know their financial landscape, uh, to know which uh, funding opportunities are available, and also to uh, know what um, like to investigate and to learn uh, what are the uh, rules and procedures and requirements of each particular uh, donor, because uh, these uh, requirements uh, differ from one to one. And uh, with regards to ecosystem services, also it is a emerging topic. For example, in our case, in uh, one of the basins, the Dniester Basin shared by Moldova and Ukraine, such assessment uh, was done within the uh, Jeff International Waters project. And uh, the numbers, uh, I, I don't remember them, but they were big. And uh, uh, it is, um, but it was the first effort. So we do need to do this kind of assessments and to bring them to the attention of the uh, local government and local population also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, I think that's that's very clear, especially on this issue of, of capacity building. I think for for the water people or in, within the water sector, we, we really need to strengthen the, the issues of capacity building, especially on how to access these uh, innovative climate uh, funds for the benefit of uh, uh, those institutions charged with management of transboundary uh, river or wetlands or lakes resources. So I think that's a that's one of the of the key points that, they, that I've taken from your from your from your inputs. So I would like before uh, we come to the hour to thank uh, to thank all our presenters and uh, for their very valuable inputs. Also to the colleagues that in the chat they have also now shared available and, and further resources on, on some of the issues that we have been discussing, management plans, also groundwater. We can also share some of the evaluation of ecosystem services that we have uh, that we have uh, done here in the Nile Basin. Those issues, they, they, they serve also as illustrations and examples of things that we can do at the transboundary level for uh, uh, not only developing further the, the, the resources, but also bringing this uh, um, element of, of climate change. So, so thank you very much to IUCN, to UNECE, to the NBI, and of course to Wetlands International for their, for their ongoing support and for being available for this, uh, for this event. I would also like to share and, and thank uh, our donor, the Ministry of Environment of, uh, of Germany, specifically the International Climate Change Initiative that has made this, uh, this event possible. I would like to thank also the organizers, uh, CIWI specifically, for, for, uh, for taking into consideration our event. And uh, I would like finally, to bring to the attention of all participants uh, the fact that we're going to continue this discussion on water and transboundary, uh, on climate and transboundary water management next Thursday on an IUCN hosted event on transboundary cooperation for resilient basin development. So we will continue uh, these issues of transboundary on uh, next Thursday, 26th. Um, and with that, I would like to thank, of course, uh, all the participants for your for your uh, interesting questions, for uh, for your comments, and for being with us. Uh, I would like to wish you all a very fruitful and a, and a fantastic virtual uh, World Water Week. Of course, it would have been nicer to, to see you all in, in Stockholm, but at least we have these, these platforms. So thank you very much once again, and see you in the upcoming events. Goodbye from Entebbe. Thank you very much, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.